Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. I'm Pat Hegarty, one of the ministry team here, and it's just good to be here for the movie series. I've had a ball. It's, I must say, preaching for the movies is a little bit harder than normal, but, it, but it's been a great exercise. So what we're doing is essentially bouncing off the narratives that we find Hollywood uses because they're human narratives. And so we're not saying the gospel according to Hollywood in any sense of the word, but what we find is that the messages that come out of Hollywood, because I've invested so many billions of dollars over so long, they're incredibly expert at reading the soul of, of the humanity. They understand the narratives that we go through, the breakthroughs that we have to have and so on. And so what we want to do is just integrate those narratives into the greater faith story because everyone on this planet is on a faith journey, every single one. And uh, sometimes we think in church world, we think, well, there's insiders and there's outsiders and that's, and that's where we're going today. But everyone, as far as God is concerned, is welcomed into his house. Everyone is on that journey of faith. And so today we're bouncing off the Toy Story of all things, uh, of all things. But I've selected Toy Story 4 because, uh, has, can I get a show of hands? Who's seen Toy Story 4? A good number. Has anyone seen Toy Story anything? Righto. So you understand Toy Story. So Toy Story 4, I must admit I hadn't seen it until this week either because uh, I couldn't get past Toy Story 1. You just weren't going to beat that sucker. Me and Buzz Lightyear, I get that guy. Woody was a bit of a feeble man at that stage. He had a lot of growing up to do, but Buzz had it going pretty early. So, um, but Toy Story 4, by the time we get there, the, the story has evolved and Woody's become a whole different person. But the whole premise of Toy Story is it's a, it's a world that's a predictable system. And I'm going to bounce this off as an allegory for the church today. Because in Toy Story, there are children uh, and there are toys and the, and the children own the toys. The toys exist to bring pleasure to their child. But... The relationship is weird because in Toy Story, the toy, toy to child relationship loyalty remains. The toy always stays loyal. But as far as a child to the toy, there is no loyalty there. It's as long as I like that toy, I like that toy. But when I grow up, you're out. And so the toy who's, been, who's loyal has to go through this whole passage of uh, disassembling love for one child to another or they're discarded. Um, but when a new favourite toy comes along, that's even harder. A new favourite toy comes and it creates a lot of tensions and soul-searching. If you remember Toy Story 1, when, when Buzz Lightyear turns up, Woody just gets his jealousy on and it's get, it all turns pear-shaped. And so this is where we begin to introduce this as a parable for the church. Now, if you, if you are an unchurched or de-churched or anti-church person, you are so welcome here. I love conversations with people who are outside our normal bubble. I got a chance to be at a wedding. It was my, my daughter's wedding. We, it was a bit low uh, profile. We just loved the quiet events. So we did a wedding for our family yesterday. And it was just great having people who don't, weren't normally at church there. So we're handing out movie tickets and we're having conversations of faith. And, and it's just brilliant to be able to do that. I actually really love that sort of stuff. But us churchy people, if you can forgive us for a moment, we, we have all these assumptions of our worldview. We have assumptions of the way things work and how people should think. We get a bit religious on it every now and again. And so we like to think in terms of uh, liturgy, which is a word that means what's the process that we go through? What's the journey that we have on a Sunday, for example? What are the things that we always do? Don't change those sacred cows. Never start the barbie up and put them on there because we're not changing those sorts of things. We have different ideas of our emphasis and our formats. I mean, you wouldn't normally see gold stars on the side of a church. But today, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not have popcorn and slushies? Is it, does the Bible say not to? Then why not? Everything has a purpose. So anyway, one of our assumptions that we can easily format because we get to know each other and there are things called insiders and there are things called outsiders and those who are on the in are people who don't have tattoos and drive Harley Davidsons and swear and those on the out, oh, hang on, it's Queensland. <laughs> they do drive Harley Davidsons, they do have tattoos and they do swear I found. This is a real culture shock. Coming from New South Wales, there was a couple of things I noticed coming as a Sydney boy to Queensland, the religious world in Queensland. It's a little bit, I won't say it's a Toy Story bubble, but, but it was different. We danced to everything, every song, even a dirge. We would, we would have a Pentecostal two-step. We would do that. No one dances up here. As I got older, that was a good thing. It gets hard to stop once you start. But anyway, there are insiders and there are outsiders. And like on, in Toy Story, when the, when the outsiders, the unchurched people come to church, 
it can introduce tension if, if our mindset is not focused on those who are out. If we've got an inside-out mindset instead of an outside-in mindset, it can muck things up a little bit and we have to deal with the way the two different groups of people see themselves and how we deal with the awkward sort of baby that comes into the church. So if we can just zoom into this first clip now, we watch what happens to this in Toy Story when there's a new kid on the block. I know it's a sporky, forky, forky is a spork. The question in case, in, in case for this though is that every church has a Woody or two. Every church has a guy like Woody in there and they're disruptors and, they're, and there's something happened to this guy because it's not like the crowd that uh, Forky got interest to was a bunch of weirdos. They were just normal, they were just the guys, just the gang. But now and again in every crowd, like a crowd this size, there'll be, there'll be three, four, five super reachers. So these are the dynamic ones who just live for the outsider. They love, they find ways and they, they'll disrupt the crowd and they say, we need to be thinking more about the outside and we need those people because it corrects the comfort zone of people who are in church. So we need that. But Woody has become the defender of the new guy, but Woody wasn't always like this because he once had to deal with a new guy that came to town and pushed him out. But Woody discovered what it's like to be discarded. And I don't know whether you've ever remembered what it's like to be discarded to know what it's like to be an outsider. You know, most of us who are in this room, we've only been here at Max a, a couple of years, so we all know what it's like to not be in the room. We know what it's like to be someone new in the room. We're all essentially still new in the room, and to be honest, there's, all, there's something a bit forky about all of us. That's not in the script, by the way, I'm just making this up, but we're all a little bit, we're all a little bit like that, aren't we? We don't think we are, but other people tend to think that way. But there's, the point here is there's a disproportionate amount of energy needs to be invested into bringing the lost in. It goes against what's natural. We need the super reaches, we need those to provoke us and stir us and remind us that the reason we're here is not just for us, we are here for us, but we're here for the world and our mission is to those who aren't in the room and who's ever gonna advocate for those who aren't in the room? If the only voices that get heard are our voices, of course we're gonna meet our own needs, aren't we? It's just human nature. But Luke 15, 4 says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. And isn't it like that? Just as heaven rejoices every time. And every week now, we're having people make uh, a declaration of faith in Christ in the church. And every time we rejoice, because the, the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we rejoice too. It reminds us why we're here and what we're doing. But the church is a home for, place, uh, for people like Forky. And we're all that Forky person. John Altberg wrote a book once, if you've ever read his stuff, it called Everyone's Normal Till You Get to Know Them. <laughs> you've obviously not read that book. Um, his point is that there, he says, who's normal? He says, you're certainly not normal, talking to the, the reader, and neither is anyone who knows you. It's just that we all think that we are because we're based on our own center of gravity and we all see everyone else through our own thing. The bottom line is everyone else is actually, can I give just break the ice of this, everyone probably thinks you're a little bit weird, except you. So much easier to identify than others. But most people think most people are weird except themselves. And so this is why we have to prioritize in the church world this priority of identity and in, in, in discipleship. When it help people understand, I'm not, I'm a toy, I'm not trash. I'm not trash, I'm, I'm not. I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God. I'm made in his image. I have a reason for existing. There are people who are my people. I'm not trash. And sometimes it's a lifetime that we have to spend to convince and understand and know through the ministry of God's spirit that I am not trash. You are not trash. Because that's all the world will wanna tell you. You're just put together by bits of dust. Somehow the cosmos just materialized a thoughtful, intelligent, thinking being like you. That's gotta be the biggest miracle I can think of. But we, we buy into that and we think, well, I'm just dust. I'm made of the same stuff that the sun's made of. Who am I? And that's the starting point. So there's a lot of work to do there. So we've got to turn people from trash to treasure. But then the church people, we get this common question, how do we find them? How do we get more forkies in the room? As if there's not enough already. Because we're worried about their eternity. We're worried that they're playing fork out there and they're living in those sort of world, but they don't know what we know. They don't have Jesus in their, in their heart. They haven't found that redemption that comes from placing our faith in Christ to pay for our sins. They don't know that. So we wanna know. And so the church now for almost 30 years has been, if you read the same books that I do, 
engulfed in a polarising debate about how do we get more forkies? How do we save forky? Do we invite them to something like this or do we go out and find them? In, invitational is called an attractional model and do, do we go out, it's called an incarnational model. So we've got, we, the first thing we do is we find really long words for these things. But we, we're talking about strategy as if we've got to pick one at the expense of the other. But why not invite people to something like this? And why not go out? Why would we ever think we've got to choose one of those things? And so this church is invitational. This church is incarnational. We do it every Monday. That's why we pray for God at work. Because we're all going to be out tomorrow in the community reaching these people. But much of the argument is centered around how we convince them. It's a strategy sort of argument. And we look for this proverbial key. What's the key to our community? And this is a great conversation because if I was in Malaysia, for example, the key to the community is always food. It's food. You want to attract people to something, just put food on. They'll just come. It's the same in Australia. But for young people, it might be music, it might be lights and, and vape and all the things that we do here on a Sunday night. Whatever it is, what's the key? What, what provides a platform? Because if we're over here in all the understanding that we have of the gospel and God, but they're over here with none of that, how do we build a bridge? We've got to start from where they are at. We've got to find common ground, things that they understand, environments that they understand. So it's not a conflict to come with all the crowd and come and say hi. It's easy to take those first steps. But in Toy Story, it's a really funny thing because it gets weird, just like it does for us. Christians are weird people. We do very odd things. And so in looking for this key, we'll do strange things that normal people wouldn't do. Like we'll knock on doors and say, hi, I'm from the church. Want to come? No. Not if I've got to be like you, I don't want to come. Or we'll get up on a soapbox in the street with a big bullhorn and start telling people they're going to hell in a handbasket. What a great plan. That's really going to get, build a bridge of conversation, isn't it? I'm good, you're bad, you've got to work a lot harder. You've got to be like me. No, I'd rather go to hell than be like you. Because if you're there, I don't want to be there. I've had that conversation. Have you had that conversation? Or we go through the, the four spiritual laws monologue or we'll, we'll have them scare them out of hell talk, all those sorts of things. We get a bit ham-fisted with it because we're not really nuanced. We think there has got to be a secret key. And in Toy Story 4, there's this really fascinating moment where they're looking for the proverbial key because Forky's got himself lost again and locked in a cabinet in a store. So they all go to save him and they're looking for the key. And there's these two bizarre characters that look like these gentle stuffed animals, but they're really big people from Harlem. They're just, they're just looking for a fight. You look at them and you go, you're so lovely, but then they want to kill you. And they, they've tried to form a strategy for getting the key. So let's have a look at this next clip. How do we get that key? How do we get that key? This is a quandary for people like us, isn't it? So we, we look to the church. We often look to the church to provide the way to get to the key. We, we, we're happy to, to keep coming along and, and, and doing what we do, but we're, we're expecting and hoping that somewhere, someone like myself or Zelvin or someone who's a super reacher comes up with the magic strategy to reach Kenmore and Centenary and, and Bill Barry, Karana Downs. Come on, Pat, aren't you praying? What's the key? And we spend all this energy looking for something and it ends up whatever it is, it's almost a little bit inadequate. But look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 about this, this key thing. He says, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I might share its blessings. He actually doesn't wait for a key. He doesn't wait for a program. He just takes himself. And this is where the gears really begin to shift in the movie and in our life where we start we, we cease the, 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 the leaning that we have to wait for someone else to get, them, get their act together. And this isn't just church now, we're talking about Western life. Can the government not make a decent decision? Can my boss just not figure it out? Can someone not just get their act together and, and make the life the way I expect it to be? And Paul says, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying, to the weak, I become weak. He takes it back to a granular level because if the West has done anything to us over the last 100 years, it's replaced relationships with resources. 
It's replaced relationships with mechanisms and legislation and, and procedures and policies to protect and to guide and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and the default for our mind then is to say, I have no responsibility myself. And yet the gospel is only shared powerfully in one way, personal responsibility. When we take it and we share it to the people that we know. Because you can't program what needs to be personal. We can do all the stuff and we will do it. We'll put on movie series, we'll have the lights, we'll have the movies, we'll do alpha, we, but they don't replace relationship. All those things are is a path for people who are invited or when we've gone out and we've connected with them and we say, I'm gonna walk with you on the path. So let me now, let me break away because this has all been predictable and you know how much I love being predictable. So let's just park that for a moment because you've probably heard all of this before. And just parenthetically, I want to take us on a journey because now it's going to get really, really personal about church people like us, church people like me. Because we can develop this thing, a thing about our life, and it becomes our own justifiable mission. It becomes the thing I'll stamp my feet about and bang the desk about. It's, it's Woody chasing after Forky at whatever the cost. And it may not be religious, it might be your career, it might be your family, it might be your mission, it might be your ministry, whatever it is. But in church world, we start the conversation with the what's at stake conversation. And so we might, for us, it might be religious instruction. Man, we're dying on that hill. It's not a bad hill to die on. End times, that becomes our thing. Why don't we talk about end times here more? I talk about it all the time. Why don't you talk about it? So it becomes our thing and it's justifiable. It's a good question. Why don't we talk about it more? Maybe it's social justice. Maybe it's uh, work that the church does, whatever it is. Sometimes it's less obviously worthy things. My career really, really matters to me. Why? Because I've invested my whole life into my career. And so this thing, this becomes a thing for us, a justifiable mission. It's a, the thing that we can justify focusing our time and our passion and our money and our whatever it is on it. But even a justifiable mission becomes unjustifiable at some point back to church. Even our justifiable missions can get off track. We think we're heading north, but we just skewed off a little bit because it becomes about something else. But because it's justifiable, no one dares to confront the unconfrontable in each of us. And that Toy Story 4 is actually about this. It's not about Forky. It's about Woody. And the story just shifts gears suddenly as we begin to understand why is this guy so driven to chase this fork? And no one dare argue about it because that's a worthy cause. But he's surrounded by many other toys. There's many other things going on. Why is he so obsessed about this one thing? And so we pick up the story where they've been pursuing Forky and they've been chased out of the shop by a cat, this really aggro cat that swallows one of the toys and spits it out. It's, it's, it's gross. So I've taken that bit out for the kids who are here. And they've only just survived, the whole group of them, they've only just survived, and now they're questioning what on earth are we doing? Let's have a look. I can almost smell the sacred cows frying on the barbecue. It's like, how do you confront, how do you say something like that? How do you confront a situation when people are saying, we need to get out there and find the lost? Absolutely we do. But do I do it at the expense of all the other things that matter, of all the other people that matter? When does it become a mission that's taken its own mission? And he left me behind, for old buzz. Because there's, there's an element to this story in the gospel where Jesus says, you know, don't you leave the 99 behind and go and find the one? But leaving the 99 isn't the same as neglecting the 99 and leaving who God's given you. Again, the, the, there is no polarization here. It's all together and yet it's individual responsibility. And yet our responsibilities begin with the people that God's given us. Sometimes we can make a worthy cause unworthy. And I know many valuable people, many, many, hundreds, maybe thousands, that have died on the altar of someone else's worthy cause, doing the right thing the wrong way. Our first ministry as human beings, as people, is to the people that God's already given us. And from the overflow of that, we reach out. Then Woody says, I don't have anything else. Man, when I stopped that, I had to pause that and replay that four or five times because I know that statement. I know that statement where someone challenged me on what I was doing and it was nearly 
20 years ago now, when it stopped me in my tracks and all I could say is, this is all I have, I don't have anything else, God's called me to do this and I looked at, at the ground zero that I'd left behind of being over obsessed and doing in my strength trying to accomplish alone what was God's to fulfill and making it my own responsibility. And so Woody had masked his turmoil with a worthy, worthy cause. He couldn't let go of a worthy past and find a new worthy future. And this is, this is some of the hardest things for us to grapple with, is when do I start saying no and so I can move into my next new beginning? Because good can't begin until bad ends. Now, this is now, now we're way beyond church. Now we're, now we're your life story. Good can't begin until your bad ends. At some point, we have to know who and what and where I need to let go of. And I won't know what good is until I do that. It's relationships, it's jobs, it's churches. I say I had to discover this was church. Trish and I, we've always been faithful local church people. We'll be to the day I die. But maybe like some of you, I had my, un- my uh, between churches season. Well, I was just so sick of it. <laughs> A pastor saying that. I was so weary of the politics and playing church. So weary of all the stuff that happens because people get broken, doing a good thing. We sometimes get broken. And I bet every single one of us here who's been in church more than five years knows what it's like to be hurt in church. Hey? We know that pain. And sometimes it just gets too much because this doesn't work for everyone all the time. I estimate about 50% of the God-loving and God-fearing Christians out there don't come to a normal church service anymore. They can't do it. And I was there for a while. And I, and I dared Trish to convince me to go back to church. Even though I knew the scriptures about gathering together, I said, well, let's find a better way to gather together. So we started a little thing with my mates that I, I never had time for on a weekend because where was I every Sunday? I was at church twice a week, leading worship and preaching and doing all the stuff as a volunteer then out doing all my hours in my career. So I had Sunday afternoons free. So they all said, oh, now that we've got you, come to the park, Pat, and, and let's kick a ball around with the kids. And, and uh, one day they just, we sat down for lunch and they put a beer in front of me, knowing I wasn't a beer person, and a Bible dug out from the closet. I said, here you go, Pat, you're the Christian, teach us from the Bible with a beer. So I was like, open the page, came to 1 Corinthians 12, talking about how everyone, different parts of the body and, and so on. And in a room with a dozen people there, none of them are Christian except Trish and I, started talking about how people need people. How people need people. And they said, we need you. We need you to explain to us what this means because we don't understand. We're not over here where you are. We're way back here. And we need a bridge. And the bridge was beer and football. And that 12 people became a home group because they all got saved because someone stuck with them on Sunday afternoon and, and taught them through. And they ended up saying things like, what must we do to become a Christian? like in the Bible. I had to get out of the system. I loved the system until I didn't love it anymore. But like Woody, I didn't know where to go anymore because I'd said, this is all I have. And I couldn't discover the real depth of what that was supposed to be until I disengaged from the system because the system for me had replaced the mission, which was people. And I had to get out of it. In the end, that, that group of 12 people, we had to introduce them to the church world because we thought they needed better than us. So we, that's, that, that was our reason for engaging back in, in church world. And so t- toys had to learn this too, and it comes back in the story, this whole, this was a very difficult, you know, you, this, you talk about a kid's movie, this is grown up themes going on there, and just about every movie you watch will have something like this in there. And there was one more character called Gabby the doll, and Gabby's as messed up as Woody, but in her own way. So she's one of those obsessives who wants to do whatever it takes to get favour with a person because she just wants to be owned. So she's the, she's the one who just wants to manipulate conversations or agendas because I want to be worthwhile. How do I get the door opening for me in life? It's all right for you, Woody. You've always had it, but me, I've never been owned. I've never had a child. And so she steals Woody's backpack so that she can speak and does all these nasty things and it's horrible. But finally, she comes around and goes, I'm not doing that anymore. And she's given up trying to make the system sort of work for her anymore because it's not happening. And so they do a runner and they finally get forky out and they're all just about to join up again and meet with each other but Gabby's now with them and everything shifts in a moment have a look at what happens you know when you're watching that I wonder who you are in a story um, are you Gabby the doll are you the other guy sending them out or are you the, the, the lost person just hoping someone comes along and you can say are you lost too 
take this journey together. Woody's quote there was, this is the most noble thing a toy can do. And when it gets down to it, look at what they're saying there, because it's the same as what we're really saying here. The most noble thing that we can do is not run an alpha program or, or have a Save the City campaign or all the things that, are, that we will do. The most noble thing is one person engages with one person. It's, it's us, it's you, it's you, the person that you really are. All the foibles, all the brokenness and all the lostness engages with one other person who's also lost. Are you lost too? So it's one person engaging with a person, but the second step, step is to not present yourself like you are the answer. We don't have to have an agenda for everyone that we meet to say, you need to come to the other side of the bridge. So now we meet them right there and we just do life with them. We just have the beer and, and, and read from the Bible and kick the football without any agenda because people's journey of faith, when they're, when they're associated and, and in proximity with people of faith, will begin to ask the questions and our credibility and our love and our own vulnerability and our own brokenness because we don't have to pretend there that we're, that we're pious and religious or any of that. Just be ourselves with all our brokenness and all our fears and foibles. Just say, I'm on a journey too. How about we take this journey together? So failure is not them rejecting that journey with us. It's us not offering. It's us not holding out a hand and saying, my name is John, what's yours? Let me hear your story. Why isn't Australia saved? We're a cold relational climate. It's just, we like to drive into our driveways and shut the door on the way down. We like to come here on Sunday and shrink wrap it a little bit and then go home. It's just natural. It's okay, we're human beings. It's a cold relational climate. The way you break that is just to hold your hand out and heat the culture up, just that little bit, just to warm it up. So remember the conversation about the magic key? What's the key? It's not a program, it's not the lights, it's not all the stuff, it's you. You actually are the key to revival in this nation. One person at a time, one conversation at a time, heart to heart, one invitation at a time. How about I help you take your next step on the journey and I'll take it with you. Because only what comes from the heart will impact the heart. Only what comes from your heart will impact the heart. So therefore you can't hide, you can't create a false self and say, I'm perfect, wanna be like me. It's what comes from the real you, the real you, you, the you that cares for another human being, the you that's prepared to pray for someone even when they haven't asked for it, to prepare to put yourself out there and be vulnerable in case they say no. That's where revival happens. It always has and it always will and therefore it's always possible. See, Australia has convinced itself it's not possible because we haven't found the key. I was speaking with uh, the senior pastor of the biggest Baptist church in Australia a few weeks ago and I, and I said, what are, your, what are your contemplations on the church right now? And he, I've never seen a man of such high faith and calibre and experience get so sad and such a, <laughs> so instantly he put his head down and he said that Australians have convinced themselves it can't be done. Do you want to partner with us and just say it can be done? Because of course it can be done. All things are possible. But all it takes is one person. It's not about the program, it's about the person. What comes from the heart impacts the heart. The irony was Woody never went back to his crusade. He never went back to being owned by a child again. He went off with, with Bo and, and they found a, a life that they'd never been there before with no one owning them. Henry Cloud wrote a book about this. It's called Necessary Endings. There comes a point for all of us in all of our lives, whether it's a church or it's a job, it's a career path, Sometimes it's a relationship and we need to call a necessary ending because it's not going to be fixed and we need to walk away. You will probably never hear that in church because all things are reconcilable, all things are redeemable. Yes, they are. But unless both parties are prepared to do that in a relationship, sometimes we need a necessary ending so we can move on. We need it in our careers and often we won't find it until we've said, shut the door on one and moved into the next. Sometimes it's a church, whatever it would be. But perhaps it's your own or my own resistance to God when we know He's calling us home or calling us to our next step, calling us to faith. Maybe you've let people suffer, as I did for way too long, on the altar 
of your cause, your justifiable thing. Or perhaps you've just said no to God because it just doesn't make sense to you yet and you're waiting for it to do so. But good can't begin until bad ends. So maybe you need to have something bad end. Let's close our eyes and pray. Father, who'd have thought Toy Story would take us there? Lord, I pray for each one now who knows there'll be a number in the room who know exactly what you're saying to them. Something bad needs to end. Sometimes that bad thing is just hanging on to the history of the past, the pain of it and the hurt and the resentment of what's happened to you before. And that's bad. What happened to you was bad and hanging on to it is bad too. And for the good to happen, you need to be able to square it away. Offer forgiveness where it's necessary. Reconcile what can be, but don't bury yourself trying to reconcile what can't be. And time to move on. So Lord, I want to bless those who are in a position that the church normally would never understand. Lord, I, want, I pray that you would find them in that place. In that turmoil that Woody went through of not knowing how to say no to this thing that's been the reason for my life. That it's over now. Lord, will you meet them right there and give them the courage to take new steps. And Lord, I pray for each one here who's come from a difficult situation, and that's actually most of us. Father, we bless that history. We bless the lessons from it. But Lord, we bless our present and we bless the future you're taking us on. And if you need to take your next necessary step of placing your faith in Christ for this next moment of your life, whether you've ever met him before or you haven't, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, you can do that right now and just say, Father, I just surrender my life. It's I can't do this on my own. I can't pay the price for sin on my own. I need you to do it for me. I rely on what you've done for me at the cross. And we say amen with you today. But maybe you've known Christ for years, but now it's just as hard as it's ever been. And you need his help to move on to a new stage of life. Father, I pray you'd help them with their necessary endings and give them faith and grace for their new steps. In the name of Jesus. Amen.